Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Sayyid al-awali wa al-akhirin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Wa bishrahi sadri wa yasirli amri wa ahlu ukhrata min lisani yaftahu qawli. Begin by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We beseech him to send his peace and blessings upon our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, upon his companions, his family, and those who follow them until the end of time. Assalamu alaikum everybody. MashaAllah, it's great after being in kind of a large or confined, I don't think you can use the word confined when you talk about MCA. It's kind of like just infinite, it seems to never end. It's great to be back in more of a cozy community setting. And I was actually here uh, in this masjid, this is the Ruby Masjid, if I recall, uh, in the reign of Elias Bajan, uh, when he was here, the brother of Imam Tahir. And uh, when I was invited, you know, I remember this building, you know, where we are sitting now, uh, so it was really a pleasant surprise to see the incredible work you've done uh, in organizing yourselves um, strategically as well as financially to build this really beautiful structure uh, next door, um, which is going to now, I think, accommodate around 800 people. And in our terms, that means like 3,000 people. <laughs> you know, I lived in Egypt, so I, I became accustomed to negotiating what space really means. Right? The bus is for 20 people, and you get 100 people right? on the bus. So, inshallah, uh, may Allah bless this community, obviously, it's on, it's, it's headed in a very positive direction. Um, and oftentimes we hear so many negative things about our community, we forget to really notice um, the powerful work that's happening across the country. Um, since Donald Trump uh, kind of articulated some of the more, uh, I would say, controversial things about Mexican Americans first and then second of the back of Muslim Americans. I've seen the opposite, uh, which I'm sure the Islamophobes hope would happen, and that I've, no I've noticed a greater commitment to institutional building, institution building. Um, in New Jersey, the day after Trump made his spiel about registering Muslims, we raised like $700,000 in 30 minutes um, to ex extend the masjid. And then across the country, um, with regards to Syria, of course, and other issues, Muslim communities have really reacted very positively uh, in a way that's, I, I think, that forced the hand of many people to realize um, how great a community we are and how, how much we have to offer people. So with that in mind, what I would like to talk about is really the fact that one of the things that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi did is he gave us a sense of purpose, a sense of meaning. And we, we learned this in the Quran that we should not become overly enamored by the superficial. You know, oftentimes we get caught up in numbers or the size of a building or you know, the color of the mushaf, where ultimately real work is going to be done when it's rooted in a strategic vision which is rooted in a very powerful meaning, a purpose. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says very powerfully in the Quran, you know, مَا خَلَقَ نَسْبِينَ وَرَبَّنَا مَا خَلَقْتَ هَذَا بَاطِلَ سُبْحَانَكَ Right? Our Lord, you did not create all of this in vain. There's a purpose behind it. We believe in theology. It's mentioned in all of our famous texts that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't do something abathan, which means with no, there's no purpose behind it. Shah Waliullah Dahlawi, of course, the great scholar of Hujjatul Islam, in his book Hujjatullah Ibaliga, you know, he, he opens up this book in Persian. It was written in Persian, published in India, of course. And he talks about the fact that really people should be aware of the fact that everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does, there is great meaning. And we believe as Muslims that the meaning, the divine meaning, is brought about through creation. So we see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through his creation. We know him through his creation. And he says, You know, we, we, we beautify the creation for people. People reflect. Those who will submerge themselves in the purpose of the creation of the heavens and the earth. And their response is, Rabbana ma 
الْبَاطِلَ سُبْحَانَكَ فَقِنَا لَا So the Prophet ﷺ in the Qur'an teach us to really move beyond the superficial. And I'll give you some examples. Oftentimes people get caught up in the beauty of something. That, don't get me wrong, it's important. The process of in Allah Ta'ala, Jamil Al-Hibb Al-Jamal. Allah is beautiful and He loves beauty. But sometimes, you know, I remember when I was young, I used to play basketball, and I'd always ask the people at the shoe store, like, are those shoes going to make me jump higher? No, are those shoes going to make me quicker? I played for uh, Blake Griffin's father, so there was a lot of pressure on me in high school. Uh, are those shoes going to help me? And, you know, one guy, he told me, you know, the shoes have very little to deal, to do with the outcome. That's just like the, the wrapping on the paper. So if we look at the Qur'an, we find that it encourages us to look at the deeper meaning of things. And it does so in a number of ways. Number one is in institutions themselves. So the institution of prophethood, the institution of the Qur'an, it's not enough just to have some kind of fashionable relationship with those things. You know, I was in a Muslim country once when I was reviewing my, my Qur'an, I was reviewing and I had reached a part on Yasin. So I sat outside these people's home in a Muslim country, and I was reading Shoti Yasin. I had no idea what that meant culturally to people. You know, to see a man with a beard sitting in front of someone's home reciting Shoti Yasin. For me, I'm just making maraja of Quran, and then their phone started ringing. You know, what do you think they asked them? To see a big guy with a beard in front of their home reading the Quran. Who died? Who died? Who has been struck with some kind of massive trial? And that's the meaning of the Qur'an in that situation. It's problematic. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he, he alludes to this. He talks about the people of Mecca. He says, وَتَرَاهُمْ يَنْفُرُونَ إِلَيْكِ He says, oh Muhammad, you see them, they're looking at you. وَهُمْ لَا يُبْسِرُونَ But they don't see you. It's very interesting in Arabic what's happening here. Because ara means I see you like this. But Ubsir means I see subtleties. Imam al Asfahani said, Yani Basira bimana idraq al ta'f, wa idraq al asraf, wa idraq al hikam. He said, Basira means to, to understand the deeper ethos behind something. Right? So Allah says about the Meccans, the disbelievers, so to Araf, Yanvuru the ilayk. They're looking at you. Wahum la yubusirun. But they don't understand your meaning. They don't understand really what you're about. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The same thing with the Qur'an. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the Qur'an, inna hadha al-Qur'an yahdi li latihi aqwam wa yibashir al-mu'mineen. Right? The Qur'an is, is a guidance for people. And it directs them to righteous deeds. وَلَا يَزِيلُ ظَالِمِينَ إِلَى خَسَارَةً But evil people, what they'll take from the Qur'an is evil. It's hard for us to imagine. We think of Qur'an, we think of good. The idea is, do they understand really the deeper purposes of the, of the Qur'an and the Prophet So we're immediately taught to think at a deeper level, to think about the meanings of things. And that's why, for example, in the fundamentals of theology, we say, لا يجوز تقليد في الأصول ولكنه في الفروع you know, it's not allowed for me to say, well, just because my father or my mother are Muslim, I'm Muslim. Or my relatives back home are Muslim, I'm Muslim. No, I have to acquire the meaning of what it means to be Muslim. And then I attest to that meaning. That's why it's called shahada. Because shahada means I'm bearing witness to a meaning. The meaning is, La ilaha illallah Muhammad al The second is related to institutions. And congregations. And that's very important for you here. The elephant in the room, right? Is that you, you're building this incredible facility. But, thank you. But what, what does that mean to the city that you live in? What does that mean to the children in your community? What does that mean to the women in your community? What does that mean to your neighbors? This is something that unfortunately... When I do consulting for Muslim organizations, nonprofits in America, and I ask them, what do you mean to people? They have no answer. Usually the answer I get is, we, we invite sheikhs. 
So I said, like, what sheikh did, oh, we invited you. Okay, so Richard, your neighbor, he doesn't know who Suhaib Webb is. He doesn't care. He doesn't have any meaning to him. So as an institution, we have to think beyond the idea that once you have the grand opening, you're done. No, no, before you open, and before, and I'm sure you're doing this already, and before you entertain the idea of having this incredible facility, you understand that you should not get caught up in the aesthetic of, of the actual institution. But you should think deeply about how you're going to craft its place and position amongst the Muslim community and amongst the non-Muslim community. Meaning, crafting a community-led strategic vision. It's crucial. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us of this in the Quran. He says, أَفَمَنْ أَسَّسَ بُنْيَانُ وَعَرَى تَقْوَمْنَا Allah says, and as for the one who built his home on taqwa, taqwa is a purpose. Taqwa is that there's a reason behind now the establishment of a structure. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually condemns the idea in Surah Tawbah, Masjid al Dirar, of a mosque that has a bad purpose. And that's why the scholars, they have a maxim that says, Al ibratu bil ma'ani. That concern is given to the meaning, not the shell. That concern is given to the substance, not the decoration. Right? So the second thing that we see is within the framework of institutions. Right? And you're building a powerful institution, inshallah. An incredible structure. The conversation around what does it mean to the community? Obviously there's community buy-in, alhamdulillah, because you funded this incredible uh, institution. And then what will it mean to the people around us? Islamophobia, within that regard, is a battle of meaning. If we really just cut it down and rip it to its bare bones, Islamophobia is about crafting a meaning that Islam and Muslims mean something to people, and then making that meaning palatable, not to the far right, but to our allies on the left. <clears throat> the third is community members. One of the things that we maybe fail to appreciate is the meaning of the Prophet's message. You know, sometimes I ask actually young Muslims when I sit with them, what does it mean to be Muslim? And now they'll say, you know, to stand up for our rights, to be uh, invested in the struggle, right? Because struggle forces us to engage meaning. Who am I vis-a-vis -vis an adversary? But prior to that, when I would ask young Muslims, and I asked them this question, what is Islam? Wallahi al-Azim. I'm talking about children who were raised in masajids, who went to Islamic schools. And I would ask them, what does it mean to be Muslim in the modern world? I'm talking about college kids. And they would tell me, this is the first time someone asked me this question. And I don't know. Right? That, that should be a concern. Right? That people are coming into powerful institutions, whether through an educational experience, whether through a religious experience. And then they're walking out with the absence of meaning. That's more of a concern for us for the following reasons. If we do not provide meaning to each other, someone else will do it for us. If you're a young Muslim woman in America, you go through institutions and you feel that you don't have meaning. And then you run into people who say that Islam is patriarchal in its nature. You run into people who are uh, critical of Islam on certain issues. That may affect you. If you run into ISIS as a young teenage boy or teenage girl and you don't have a meaning around Islam, that may be what gives you meaning. So institutions being able to package and pastorally provide meaning. And that's why I believe, and I said it today, I think we should have like shahada parties for our teenage children when they become of age, like you have the bar mitzvah in the Jewish community. This is not bid'ah, right? This falls under what's called tajdidu iman, refreshing of the iman. And also you create a relationship now between this young person and the institution. That, you know, we have welcomed you now as a member of this community. You've said, la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, alhamdulillah. So now you have a stake in appropriating your meaning 
through the institution. People walk into our communities, not here, it's small enough that you have meaning amongst yourselves. The drama and the good stuff, right? The Tyler, the, you know, the Tyler Perry aspects of it, and the Bollywood aspects of it, and then the successful aspects of it. That's meaning. Whereas in larger communities, such as MCA uh, in Boston, we did a survey, we would ask people, and they would say, you know, I would come here for years for namaz. I would come here for years in the Friday prayer, and I never really felt a purpose being here outside of just my worship. I never felt that my, I had a stake in contributing to some kind of strategic outlook. And we're talking about people who are at Sloan Business School and MIT. I'm not talking about people who don't know how to do this. So we started to ask ourselves, how do we think about what we mean as an institution? And then how do we craft a community-led kind of strategic vision? And then how do we empower people to contribute and be critical of the growth of that vision? That's really taking institution building at a different level. And the Prophet ﷺ was ordered to do this when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَشَاوَرْهُ فِي الْأَمْرِ Here in Arabic something very interesting. He said, Shawarhu means take shura, all of them. He didn't just say the men. He didn't just say the women. He didn't just say, you know, the chacha sahibs. He says shawarhu, all of them. That's why many scholars in the early centuries of Islam, some of our great scholars like Imam Zuhri, when, when he would be charged with leading kind of the religious uh, uh, discourse for the broader Muslim community, he would actually take time out and go and live with different communities and talk with them. Uh, in Medina, he would come during Eid because he was Medini, Ibn Shihab. And he would, they, uh, Khatib Baghdad, he says, he would ask the women, he would ask the children, he would ask the adults. He was taking a survey of people. He was trying to understand how to build a strategic vision and then craft it with the aid of the people around him. So Allah says, وَشَاوِرْهُمْ This is the first part of the verse. The second is al amr Usually when we run institutions, we say, you know, God, we can't talk to the people about important things, right? They'll destroy everything. But Allah says, Al-Amr means something super important. Talk to them about those things. Craft a conversation with them, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We see this in the Quran. How many times does Allah himself, subhanahu wa ta'ala, listen to community members who we would have never thought about? The woman who comes and complains to the Prophet, Allah listens to her. She has a voice in the growth and development of the community. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sometimes even mentions the hearts of the people. You know, أَقْرَبُ يَوْمَ إِذٍ لِلْإِيمَانِ On that day they were closer to faith. So even their hearts, their emotional states are taken into consideration by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the second is, we shouldn't get caught up in the beauty of a structure, the size of a structure. And this is not being critical of you, this is to inspire you, okay? Or, or, or how awesome it is. But what is that structure going to mean to people? And how is it going to be a game changer for young people? Like, we want a structure where our young people want to come live. And I learned this the hard way. Once I was in Oklahoma with my daughter, uh, and I was asked to give a khutbah at an Islamic school for kids. The toughest audience in the world. <laughs> Goodness gracious. Try, if you can keep them awake, you've got a gift. Right? All those high school kids with all that hot, all those hot Cheetos and Nama Laters and you know, Dr. Pepper and Fetty Wap running through their veins. So I was at the mall with my daughter. And I saw all these teenagers, thousands of teenagers, you know, it smelled like clear acyl and bad deodorant. And I, I said, man, like, who, what the heck is going on? And then, you know, this is when you realize you're old. She says, like, dad, you don't know? When you hear that, it's like official cha-cha status. You got your cha-cha card. So I was like, what? And she was like, twilight. I was like, what the heck's Twilight? She's like, you know about Twilight, the vampires, they fall in love, werewolves, and I was like, so that's how I be. So that was the, the, the world premiere of the last Twilight movie. So then I asked her, hey, tell me about this Twilight thing, and then she told me, you know, it's a really strange story. Um, a white girl in love with a wolf, or a vampire and a wolf. And then 
I decided, you know, I'm going to give the khutbah on twilight. <laughs> so I went there, and they, you know, what's the topic? And these kids are like, oh, God, this is shit. Hold on a second. And they said, you know, today's topic is twilight. And they all went like, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then I had one young brother come to me and say, can you wait so I can get my friend? I'm going to see if he's home. Because they have school, they didn't tell the schools. Because he's going to want to hear this khutbah. I learned something from those children. right? If you are relevant and you're true to orthodoxy, but you're relevant, it's how you give meaning. Now, I didn't talk about Twilight, by the way. It was a plan of words. So I didn't see the movie yet. But then we were in <coughs> the last week of Breaking Bad. This incredibly <coughs> profound TV series about a teacher gone wrong. And I decided, I'm going to give a khutbah called Breaking Bad. It was the last week of the TV show. All, it, was the, it was the conversation. Because in Boston I said, you know, is it possible to give khutbahs for America? <coughs> Not just for Muslims. So that like the news will cover our khutbah. There'll be a, a public conversation around our khutbah. So I said, you know, I'm going to try to do something a little crazy. I'm going to give a khutbah called Breaking Bad. Kasr Sayyati. Break your evil. Qatta Sayyati. Cut it off. So I gave a khutbah called Breaking Bad. <coughs> Wednesday, Wednesday evening, we get a phone call from CNN. Hi, <laughs> CNN. Obviously something's not happening in the world. I mean, why do I cover this? <laughs> they were like, you know, would it be possible for us to like First of all, how the heck are you going to give a sermon about Breaking Bad? And I was like, well, if I told you that, then there wouldn't be a story. Right? you got to come and watch it, right? It's like, well, is it okay if you send a cameraman and a mom? So CNN called us, and they covered Breaking Bad. <coughs> Secondly, Shia people started coming. Like, we're really sorry. We know it's a Sunni mosque. Don't make anyone angry. But, like, we really want a Breaking Bad football. <laughs> and then they would say things like, but no spoilers, like, please. <laughs> I'm not caught up yet, I've been binge watching. Right. And then we had uh, Thursday evening, non Muslims calling saying, hey, I'm a non Muslim, is it okay if I come and listen to this sermon? <laughs> and that's what I wanted to see would happen. I didn't talk about Breaking Bad, Walter. Right? I talked about how we become bad. The, great, the best people can become evil. The best people can become Pharaoh. The best people can go from being a chemistry teacher to a meth dealer. Right? That's the discussion. But the point is, is how you give meaning. Imam al-Haddad, one of the great classical scholars, said, the job of the Muslim is to tie the heavens to the earth. The job of institutions is to make sense of the world around our congregants for them. And one of the biggest challenges we have is we are torn between three things. We want to continue to make meaning and value from the past. So, obviously some of the things I'm saying now, someone will be like, well brother, you know, this is not how khutbahs used to be. Yeah, and the khutbahs then weren't like the khutbahs before them. And the khutbahs that were before them weren't like the khutbahs before them. There was never a monolith in the discourse. The discourse is always, its wrapping paper has changed, its fundamental message is the same. The third thing is community members. So we need to ask ourselves about what do we mean to others? How do we see ourselves playing a part in this community? And as I said earlier, the Quran teaches us that people are valued, even people are considered very minuscule. They're heard and they're listened to. They have a place in the community. That's why we have fard and fard kifay. We're taught to be individual, and we're taught also to organize as a community around causes. But you see something very remarkable. If we're to package the meaning of the Prophet's message, if we're to take the meaning behind the seerah, it's a very simple thing that we should digest and build off of. And that is... The meaning of the Prophet's message is to heal a fractured world. That's it. And the job of what the Prophet was sent to do, right, outside of Tawheed, which is of course the crux of it all, is to heal people. And his ability to make people feel valued. So as an institution, are we making people feel valued? 
Or is it we feel valued from them only? There has to be a reciprocation. So I'll give an example. Uh, one of the communities that we deal with now, there's a, it's a very cold community. You know, people come, they pray, they leave. They're, they're trying to create some kind of warmth. Historically, it was an ugly community. It was split between MQM and the People's Party. You know, who has time for this election? Let's worry about that. So we, we started something called Free Hugs Friday. Okay? So a sister will sit by the sister's door. If you need a hug, I'm here for you. Brother will sit outside. Any brother that needs a hug, I got your back. It became viral in the community. When they stop doing it, people complain. You know, where's my free hug? And then they noticed that their donations went up. We asked them, listen, do you have visitor cards like churches have for Juma? Give to people when they come. Right? They fill it out. And then you have you have all these young people. Give them something to do. Hey, can you make these phone calls? Right? Would you mind calling these people? Not asking for donations, not asking for money. You just you know what really thankful you came to the Evergreen Mosque. Are you in the watch? Muslims will be like, are you sure like you're not raising money? Like, are you sure? Like, <laughs> do I need to give anything? No, no, we're just calling just to say we really appreciate your presence in the institution. Right? Saying so, and what did they notice in that institution? That their donations rose. Right? The donations that were given without a buy or a request <coughs> rose because now people feel valued. So one of the things that the Prophet does, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in healing a fractured world, is give people value. He validates them. It's one of his greatest responsibilities. As parents, whether we like it or not, we validate our children. As spouses, we validate each other. We are responsible <coughs> for creating a sense of value. That's why in the classical books of fiqh it says, you know, it's commendable to say to your spouse, how can I make you feel valued? We were leading a workshop uh, with young couples who are about to get married. And so I said, I need you to spend time alone now for 10 minutes and ask each other, how can you make each other feel valued? One of our volunteers in this program, she, she's in her late 30s. She said, well, I, no one ever asked me this question. <laughs> I said, shh, don't, don't, tell don't tell them that, man. Right. But then some of them actually struggle with how to ask this question. How to make someone feel valued. Our children to feel, that feel valued. So if we are not feeling valued at home. How can we expect to feel valued in the community? So the Prophet وسلم, even takes the mistakes of people strategically and gives them a sense of value. We take our successes and, and devalue one another. The Prophet is so incredibly profound, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He's able to take mistakes and teach people their value through their mistakes. That's genius. Not everyone can do that. I was listening one day to NPR uh, here in the Bay Area, and there was this Hindu gentleman who I think he's worth like billions and billions of dollars. He sold his startup and whatever. And they asked him, what kind of people do you hire? He said, failures. He said, what do you mean? He said, I hire people who understand the value of, of losing. Like how to turn <coughs> negative moments into positive energy. The prophet does that. With our children, how do we talk to them? You know, one time we were doing a workshop with children. We said, can you write down the top ten adjectives used to describe you at home? Wallahi, you will cry. Stupid. You know, ignorant. Alu parata, not alu parata. Ulu kapata. Alu parata is food. I'm a god aside, man. I haven't lived here a long time. I'm getting rusty. There's no daisies in DC, man. Ulu kapata. May Allah forgive me for saying it in the mosque. <laughs> but, you know, an owl's backside. You know, and I had this young Punjabi girl explain to me, you see, in our culture, owls are stupid. But in your culture, owls are smart. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yeah, they called you an owl. That means you're intelligent. She's like, no, that means I'm the owl's 
backside. <laughs> Super dumb. <laughs> like, you're not just dumb, you're like the back of dumb, right? And I was like, God, how do you Prozac? <laughs> it's depressing, right? Well, how, do we, how do we talk to our children? You know, what type of words do we use to describe them? What type of value do we give their opinion? <coughs> Sayyidina Ibrahim values Ismail. What do you think about what I'm going to do? If you look at the conversation between Nuh and his son, right, it's a very passionate conversation. He doesn't order his son or yell at his son. He listens to his son and he says, listen, you need to get on the boat, man. You need to get on this boat. And finally he refuses. But he never debases him. He's hurt. Then Allah says to say, Nuh, إِنَّهُ لَيْسَ مِنْ أَهْلِكَ إِنَّهُ عَمْنَ It's a value. Our spouses, how do we talk to each other in front of our children, right? Your daughters, the first man they will learn how to love from is their fathers. And mothers, the first son, woman that a son will learn love from is his mother. Although it's platonic, it will be learned from that modeling process. That's why Allah calls you moon and sun, right? Right? Said Yusuf said, I saw the moon and the sun. The scholar said, the moon and the sun are your parents. They shine light on you. In the darkness of dunya, they reflect it. So value, the value that we have at home, and then the value in the communities. People would make mistakes in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and he's able to redirect those mistakes to something positive. He takes the sternness of Umar and redirects it. He takes the craftiness of Khalid and Walid and redirects it. He takes the economic prowess of Abdurrahman ibn Auf and redirects it. He's able to channel threats to becoming a positive contributing factor to his kingdom. So I'm going to talk about quickly, and we'll stop inshallah ta'ala, is really moving forward, how can you be a meaningful community member? What role can you play in the community? The first is you have to lose your ego. It's very difficult. I have a problem with it. We all have a problem. Ego is a monster. But we learn from the hadith of Jibreel. Something very beautiful, and that is what's not said in the hadith is actually more, in some ways very powerful. Because who, when Gabriel came into the mosque of the Prophet and he came to ask him these important questions, who was sitting with the Prophet? Who remembers? Who's there as Jibreel is asking what's faith, what's Islam, what's Ihsan? Who, who's sitting there? Sayyidina Umar. What's powerful is that Sayyidina Umar never interrupts once. <coughs> he loses his ego. You don't think that Sayyidina Umar he knew what Islam is? Yani akhbirni al Islam. You think Umar he knows what Islam is? He goes that way, Shaitan goes that way. This happened in the later Medinan period, this incident with Jibreel. But that time, Omar, his, his level of education is extremely high. He's been with the Prophet now almost uh, 16, 17 years. Second question, what's Iman? You know, did, after the Prophet answered, did Omar say, Yeah, but you know, what about this? Or, hey, maybe that. He's quiet. Ihsan. Sayyidina Umar, he doesn't say anything, radiallahu anhu. And then at the end, after Jibreel leaves, he says, thumma sarasa, which means, I sat there quietly, I never said anything. He's able to, faladithu maliyan, I stay there silently, he said. Right? He's disciplined. So, he loses his ego. It's not about his professional position. It's not about his education. He's one of the few people who can read and write in his time. So the first is to be very aware of the dangers of when we start to tell ourselves, you know, the community doesn't listen to me because I am, that's a problem. And that's why some Sufis, they say, you know, the word I am is, is a shaitanic word. Ana khayra minhu. Anna, 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 I, 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 always in the Quran, Shaitan, I, 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 I. We say, Iyaka na'budu. We. The second thing 
is we should be concerned with each other. And not in the way that is a, a used to spy on people or to feel better because other people's children are having trouble or, you know, <clears throat> this marriage is falling apart. No, I'll do that. But to legitimately have concern as a community for one another, to organize and craft institutionalized concern. <clears throat> Look at the hadith again. Hadith of Sayyidina Jibreel models community. When Jibreel comes into the community of the Prophet ﷺ, notice that the beginning of the hadith is very interesting. We were with the Prophet. ﷺ. So the idea is that the Prophet is with his community. Just, you know, we're just hanging out with the Prophet. There's no dakari. But then suddenly someone comes and we don't know him. We never saw him before. His clothes were clean, which means that clean clothes were kind of something rare amongst the companions of the Prophet. <coughs> His hair was not disheveled. So they're aware of new people. They pay attention to new folks. They welcome new folks. So they spend the early part of the hadith is talking about how he looked and we didn't know him and he came this, 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 this. So we learn as a community to be concerned for one another, to look out for one another, to be welcoming. The Prophet wasallam said, whatever causes his fellow Muslim to be happy, Allah has made Jannah an obligation for that person. The third lesson is that we should be skilled in conflict resolution. You know, the only thing I worry about you guys is I see it everywhere. People build, people have these really small, loving community, we're all tight together. We got, you know, dude putty coming straight out the, the, the stove. But where's the Kashmiri shot? Right. There's a tremendous sense of belonging. And then the success of an institution puts stress on that relationship. So the third thing is I encourage you, honestly, to really think about having workshops and conflict resolution. One of the things in D.C. that we're trying to employ with people who want to join our center is that they have to take a workshop on conflict resolution. We tend to just hope that we won't have conflict, but we are going to have conflicts. How many ethnicities are in this one room right now? How many divergent philosophies and political ideologies and religious kind of directions are existing in one room? You have a younger generation, older generation, men and women with different concerns from the Stanford Cardinals to the Berkeley Bears, right? Tremendous differences. So I encourage you as you move forward to really think about finding someone who knows what they're doing, not a sheikh or an imam, someone who knows what they're doing to lead the community through a discussion on conflict resolution. How do you settle disputes? Traditionally, it hasn't been done very well. People get mad, they get angry, they leave, they start a new community. Like, really? Gee. Let's just burn resources, and burn more resources, and burn more resources in the name of frustrations. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, when ta'ifatani min al-mu'minin aqtatalu, when the believers fight, Allah acknowledges the fact that believers are going to fight. Here fighting means with, with weapons. He says, asliha, fa aslihu bayinahum. Make peace between them. Resolve the conflict. So there should be really a strong conversation about not only conflict, but potential threats to the institution. That will occur, right? The cohesiveness of the community will be threatened because shaitan is working overtime. How do we get beyond that? And that takes us to the fourth. As communities, we have to be invested in communicating with one another. It's very important. Marriages, communication, communication. Friendship, communication, communication. Our relationship with Allah who subhanahu wa ta'ala is predicated on an obligatory form of communication is prayer. So there has to be open avenues of discussion amongst the community. Town hall, for example, that are facilitated by a third party, not the board president or the imam. Once I was in Boston and they wanted to have a town hall meeting and the facilitator didn't show up. And the discussion was how can we improve the imam? 
<laughs> and they're asking me to facilitate this discussion. <laughs> so I said, you know, mashallah, I was joking. I said, I don't think you even need to have this discussion. <laughs> like, the imam is freaking amazing. Man. This guy's awesome. And then people were like, you know, even though you're joking, like we can't really share. Right? So having a third party to facilitate discussions around the community, right? The meaning of the community is extremely important. So those are things, insha'Allah ta'ala, I didn't, I, I came, I was thinking just to give a simple Iman lecture, but you know, when you see the amana of this institution, right, you, you really have to think now about what it's going to mean. It's one of the most, it's going to be like the most beautiful church in the city, right? Who has this view, right? I mean, that, that's a sale for people. One day, perhaps they're building this beautiful, I saw it happen in Phoenix, they built this really beautiful masjid or tempi. And then they received a phone call from the city. And the city of Tempe was like, you know, we just want to let you know, even though none of you are at our city council meetings, we just want to let you know that your building has put, been put on one of like the historic landmarks of the city because it's so pretty. We had to do it without you because we couldn't find it. <laughs> it's kind of sad, right? So you can see those kind of things happening. And I'm like, here the community is much more mature in its engagement. But again, thinking about moving beyond the fashionable things and getting into the deeper meaning, the deeper issues, right? Islamophobia is forcing <coughs> us to address meaning in a very powerful way. With the Quran, with the Prophet, we're encouraged to think deeply. <laughs> Number two, we talked about the institution. Not to get caught up in how it looks and it's really cool. We have like all these cool dialects and stuff. No, no. There's a deeper purpose behind and I'm sure you already have crafted this, right? What this institution means. Those of you in the tech field, look at it like an app. Right? An app has to have a purpose if you're going to sell it. It has to be some kind of value prop. What's the value prop of the institution for the Muslim community? And he said it today, we're bringing all these programs, we're bringing excellent imams, right? It's a value prop, it's beautiful. Right? We're bringing talented people. And then the third thing we talked about is being community members the importance of dropping the ego. Right. Whenever one of my kind of strategic consultants from Kennedy told me something, whenever you're in a meeting and you feel like you're about to make an emotional decision, don't make it. And secondly, he told me, whenever you're in a meeting and that little voice inside you is telling you, you're right because you're from here, or you're right because you have this, or you're right because they don't understand your awesome position. He said, usually you're wrong. Right? So be careful about that. And the third thing we said is the ability to craft a community-led discussion. The last thing also that we should add is getting everyone involved. There should be young people having a stay in the, in, in the youth and what kind of programming the youth want, what they want to do, where they're heading. There should be women in your leadership who are sharing, hey, this is, you know, the, the, this is nothing to do with Sharia, by the way. This is absolute cultural nonsense when people say like you know oh, people will not be successful who, when a woman leaves them many ulama like Ibn Hajar said what that meant is for those women in particular those people in particular that were led by that person not other women in other situations so everyone should have a part in this process but barakallahu feekum jazakumallahu khair we can take uh, any questions but I think you have a great opportunity moving forward the community is extremely invested financially. It's sanctioned this nonprofit by donating, which is an incredibly healthy sign, right? Uh, but we'll take any questions about anything, as long as it's easy, that you want to ask. Can you please pass me this question? Oh, wow. uh, I forgot my glasses. Um, so the first question is how to guide slash control a son who wants to spend hours in computer games and videos. Please advise in Islamic way. Yeah, I mean, I think the first thing is you have to create a lock. I did that, I did that with my son. My son uh, played Call of Duty about 25 hours a day. Uh, and FIFA. Yeah, so, and I almost did it too. But what we had to do is sit down to him and say, look, homie, you can play, but you have to earn the right to play. 
And we just made it based on a merit-based system. Merit-based system. And if you don't want to get along, then we can just throw it out the house. So you got to be a little firm about it. You know? And mothers, you can't crack. And fathers, you can't crack. Well, we threaten a punishment. We don't follow through with it. And we're, we're, we are creating a massive problem. <coughs> because at the end of the day, it's like, yeah, I got to do anything. So who cares? I've been there, I know. Right? So I think there has to be, first of all, not just like, oh my God, why do you play these games? Games are awesome. Right? Let's be honest, especially have those Samsung glasses. Games are amazing. But how do we create discipline? And you do that by respecting, saying, listen, I know your games are really cool and you like them and da-da-da-da-da, but if you don't get it together, you're in big trouble. You'll have no more games. So you have to create discipline. That's how you do it. And you have to be firm. And let them get mad and upset and all that. They'll be fine. They're teenagers. I feed them some pizza or something. <laughs> So the next question is, in regards to Muslim American youth choosing their spouses, parents hold immense rights over their children, but what are the rights of children regarding choosing their spouse, especially for a young woman? All right, I'm going to give an answer that will probably keep me from coming back for another 10 years. <laughs> and that is, parents, you do not have a right to choose your child's spouse. It does not. <laughs> is that like a hallelujah? It's the wrong, <laughs> wrong congregation. <laughs> it's the wrong church. The Pentecostals are down the street. And I understand, but you don't have the right. I get this question. It's destroying children. And it's not fair to the person that you make them marry. It's like that TV show, Married at First Sight. Yeah, it is. Like that. It's like basically you don't know the person, you have nothing in I mean, uh, would we let our child go on to the mall with a stranger? Or we're going to let them marry someone just because they're from our family or they're from our village or they're from our country. Man, it's been, especially with women in America, because these girls are American, right? It is a disaster. And it's getting worse now. It's exasperated by the fact that younger American Muslims are now more American. You know, 30 years ago, they may have been more Desi. They may have been more Arab. They may have been fresh. Right? But now you're talking about young people who have spent 90% of their lives or more in this country are going to marry someone who thinks that 50 cents is change. It's <laughs> a problem. And the, even the constructions of what love means, you know, uh, that's a problem, right? So, no, they have a right to choose their spouse. What do we have a right to do as parents? To advise them. And if it's a code red, you know, like if my daughter wanted to marry Wiz Khalifa, <laughs> that's that's where I'm like, no, <laughs> right? But if she wants to marry, you know, Rashid, the white convert who's been Muslim for ten years from Bosnia, who works at Cisco, that's not Wiz Khalifa. <laughs> That's, that's a different person. It's not the midget from the Game of Thrones. <laughs> it's a normal Muslim man. Right? And I know when parents are hearing this, they're like, I hate this Imam. <laughs> I know, I have children, but trust, trust Allah that the Prophet ﷺ did not. In fact, when people came to me and complained that my parents are making marry me someone, marry someone, he would annul the marriage. Right? This is in Sahih Bukhari. Someone came to Imam Ahmed and said, my, and this is another problem, when we choose to marry someone, they come and say you have to divorce them. Man, this is, this is fitna. Like, this is shaitanic. Like, this is bad. You know, the Prophet said, it's reported that he said that when divorce happens, shaitan celebrates. So, someone came to Imam Ahmed and said that, you know, my parents want me to marry someone, I don't want to marry them. Then the parents came. And, and then he said, you don't have that right. This is Imam Ahmed. And they said, what about Umar ibn Khattab? He ordered the son to divorce a woman, and then he ordered him to marry a woman. He said, when you become like Umar, come back and talk. <laughs> because what we don't realize is that Umar is a faqih. 
Omar is a scholar, right? And Omar is Omar. But I, I, I really believe that we have to guide. And I think also children, we need to listen to our parents' voices also. Right? There, there, there's this sweet balance that has to happen where we're not forcing them who to marry, but at the same time, if, 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 if our parents are giving us legitimate reasons. For example, we found out that it's Wiz Khalifa. Right. May Allah guide him. Or we found out, you know, you're bringing home, you know, Bieber. Right? Those are legitimate concerns. Zayn Malik, well, Daisy, maybe. No, no, no. No, Zayn Malik. Gigi won't let you do that. But the point is, right, we should listen to the. My experience is when you listen to your parents, there's a lot of bar. But at the same time, who you spend the rest of your life with is your choice. No one has the right to make you spend your life with someone you don't like. Right. Yes, ma'am. Um, could you please elucidate some more of the legitimate reasons? Um, For what? That a parent might say no. I mean, I think if someone has an abusive past, um, if someone has a reckless past that we know about, um, if someone is known to be uh, a very shady person, those are all legitimate reasons now where the father could come and say no. Mother can say no. Um, and they haven't reformed. Right? Um, if, say, the person has another wife, hypothetically, right? No. Um, say that I, I think a legitimate concern is like a new convert who's like a year in. And I think people need time. Like, honestly, I think one year is not really enough to really see um, egregious disrespect for your culture or your parents, right? Those are reasons to say no. Yes? Sorry, just one more. Um, what if that... Yeah, I wonder who wrote the question. Ahmed, <laughs> <laughs> ah, do you know? I don't know either. <laughs> um, what if the convert's parents are not Muslim? That doesn't matter. How many Sahaba were parents were non-Muslim? They got married, right? But again, let, let's 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 talk about how long-term that may look. Uh, are they non-Muslims who we can build with? Are they non-Muslims? Because listen, extended family is very important to your parents for a good reason. Uh, it cannot be negotiated. I've seen it work well. I've seen it where people just it doesn't work at all, and I've seen it work well. But that's not in itself a reason to say no. So the next question is, am I a disobedient child if I do not agree with everything my parents tell me? Of That's course. what's going on. <laughs> I'm talking about institution building. <laughs> the institution building. No one walk here, there's a, a hole in the floor that will drop you to a shark tank. Yes. You'll block this man's video. <laughs> <laughs> it's awesome, man. <laughs> Can you read that question one more time? Oh, uh, sure. I need a bottle of Ruasa. <laughs> <laughs> There's some water here. I need a bottle of 40 ounce Ruasa. All right. Am I? A no, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. All right. Oh, there's, 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 there's water here. Ruasa. Yeah. Oh, Ruasa. Kombucha. 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 So, am I a disobedient child if I do not agree? I'm joking about Ruasa. <laughs> if I do not agree with everything my parents <laughs> tell me. God. <laughs> Like the last time. <laughs> no, you're not. Of course not. Like, how are you expected to do every single thing they tell you to do? That would be like the Egyptian government right now. <laughs> Dictatorship. Man. And parents, like, we can't expect them to do every single thing. Why? Because they're not angels. They're people. <laughs> right? So, we, we, as our children get older, I have this with my daughter now. The autonomy finding their own autonomy, which is we want them to be autonomous, but then respectful. So you give them some room to make mistakes, and screw up, see sometimes the good, and maybe they have, they see it different than you do. And I'll ask you, do you ever agree that your children are right and you're wrong? That's a problem, because you can't be right all the time. Right? So how do you say, you know what, maybe I should have made 
alu parata <laughs> instead of chicken curry. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> have, we ever, have you ever said this to your children? <laughs> You're right. You know, I, I think one time one child, is that English? You're right. I've never heard that before. <laughs> that has to be a balance, man. That has to be a balance. And Islam is not saying, like, your parents are like, oh, God. This is us saying that so we can control you. Okay? But it's flexible. It's flexible. Unless it's, like, in the big things. Like, if, if, you know, if you're eating, like, Swiss cheese or a sharp cheddar, and, you know, your mom is like, good, <coughs> sharp cheddar. You're like, no, but I like Swiss. Like, you're going to hell. <laughs> <laughs> and also, in Christian, my parents used to do this to me, man. You know, orange juice, apple juice. Like, Jesus ain't happy. Je- Jesus don't care about juice. <laughs> <laughs> so, relax. But, and the thing, parents, that you have to think about is quit finding value in your children becoming what you want them to become. But you find value in what Allah has blessed them to blossom into very different. We try to live vicariously through our children, we end up harming them. Right? And that's not fair. Like one girl said, my mother loved this man and I hate him. I said, you marry him. She said, well, I have your dad. Well, okay then. But I, I can't marry the guy you want me to marry because you like him. Like, I have to have some kind of say in this process. The same with the young men. But I will say we tend to raise our daughters and love our boys. We need to raise our boys too, and love our daughters. Too. Dude, what's next? <laughs> what could be more controversial? I, I found my husband on Tinder. <laughs> what's next? Man? They want to be on the right side, you know. Swipe right. These are no. I don't know. These are no lowball questions here. So this next one. Mm-hmm. I have noticed that there is a subtle and not so subtle racism that runs through the Muslim community. How do we combat that, combat this, especially in regards to our converted brothers and sisters? So I'm a blonde-haired, blue-eyed white man talking about the problem of racism in America. It's kind of problematic. Uh, <laughs> everything that, you know, a tremendous amount of my <clears throat> success was born on the back of privilege. America is a country which you know, white Americans historically are the greatest subsidized people in history. Right. So I feel a little, uh, you know, strange. I think in my experience as a white person, a white guy, people ask me, you know, why do you change your last name? It's my 401k, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Acknowledging, for example, the privilege you may have, and then trying to live with that responsibility. I think that's one of the challenges we, we tend to have in our community. And then, and this is gonna sound harsh, like what am I proud of as a white American? Am I proud of killing Indians? Am I proud of the structural oppression toward black Americans? And what am I really proud of? I think also that's a question people who fear have this problem should ask. And what is it that makes you feel this way? And then they'll realize, you know, I'm really maybe <coughs> covering up some insecurities by acting this way. Yeah, but it has to be acknowledged and dealt with, and toba, repentance, and striving to be. Um, and there's a difference, though, between racism and ignorance. Sometimes we may be ignorant of something. That's different than acting on. And sometimes we're fearful. Like, you know, sometimes convert brothers explain to them, like, you know, maybe this brother doesn't speak English well, you know, so he's shy to talk with you because he doesn't want to make like mistakes, or doesn't want to offend you. Right? So there, there's a, a process on both sides, I guess. Next question is, is it okay for us to be American, except for the things that are forbidden to us, in terms of our cultural identity? What am I going to do? <laughs> <laughs> of course, you're American. If you're born here, you know, you're as American as everyone else. And that's one of the goals of Islamophobia, as well as the far right, in the Muslim community to remind you that you're not American. So then what are you? You're kind of like lost. Right? But you, like any other religious tradition or any other ethnic group or cultural group, you take the best and you leave the evil. And that's it. 
And that's why, you know, the majority of fit councils across the world have said it's allowed to get citizenship in America, right? It's allowed to take that on. It's not something forbidden. <coughs> the next question is, uh, and I think there are, both these questions are somewhat related. Thank God. <laughs> How can we teach our youth to be proud in their Muslim identity uh, post 9 11? Oh, it's a challenge, but I think having strong institutions uh, is key. You know, one of the things that I noticed in New Jersey, a community that I do some consulting for, is they'd have the soccer team that went 14 0. I mean, they smashed everybody. It's a high school soccer team. And now the girls are like, hey, we want a soccer team. And, you know, the whole entire community like, got behind this undefeated soccer team. So having activities that allow Muslim youth through their Americanness goes back to the previous question, to be proud of something. I mean, believe it or not, most teenagers, you can't just tell them, hey, our mosque is cool, be proud. It doesn't really work. It has to be things they're doing, things that are happening in their lives, right, that they're able to reflect their Muslim identity off of and gain a sense of value from it. Uh, the next question, uh, I think we have two left. Uh, many women and men are getting older, ages 35 plus, in brackets. And they keep rejecting people that they won't get married. How do we convince them to, um, I suppose it's written, lower their standards? <laughs> <laughs> So, I mean, I think this is a very good question, right? and I think it's go it goes back to this kind of utopic expectation we have, number one, religiously for people, but then culturally. You look at the images that we see on TV, you look at the images we see through Bollywood, um, you know, these people, I mean, they have contouring, now, right? They can actually change how you, your face looks. I have a TV show, Malaysian Women, so I know all about makeup. Uh, it's crazy, you know, uh, concealer, all that stuff. But contouring, that was insane. It can actually make you look like a completely different person. And I think that when we allow those constructions of beauty to create what we see as being reality, we tend to have a really, really, I would say, false set of expectations around the spouse that we're looking for. If we're talking about emotional maturation, um, intellectual compatibility, that's a different issue. Those are very real, I think, concerns. But beauty, you know, you gotta be in the 75% range. You know, you've gotta be able to bend. Spirituality, you've gotta be in the 75% range. Professionalism, 75%. So I would talk with those people and try to understand why do you keep saying no. Understand also for a woman in the Muslim community, unfortunately, it's really a one shot opportunity and you know the idea of whoever I marry if it doesn't work I may be sentenced to being single for the rest of my life so I gotta make sure that I choose the Tesla 30 you know I gotta get the best one and, and that that that's also part of the existential crisis we have in the community about women um, so I would have want to have a conversation right with those people and why why do you turn down everybody that comes your way um, and that would probably help us then find Ryan Gosling or something with a kufi on it. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan Gosling with a kufi. Yeah, <laughs> uh, The next question is, and it looks like this comes from one of our youth who are here. How can the youth's voice be heard throughout the Muslim community? Um, and perhaps may never be an Islamic family. That's a good question. So how, as young people, can you be heard? And why you have to earn people's respect? Um, and by being young, unfortunately, some people, not all, but some people may not listen to you. It's because you're young. So you've got to earn it. Um, number two is, I think within the framework of Evergreen, ask to have a youth representative on the board, or on the EC, right, who's able to say, hey, these are the concerns, of, uh, a young man and a young woman, uh, these are the concerns that we have. This is the budget. Put a budget together. It's the budget that we need for the next year. And that's how you're going to get your voice heard. But understand this well. Even Muhammad says something. He's so special. But if he doesn't, if he doesn't act, he won't be heard. 
Yeah. Like, you're not that awesome, right? I'm not that awesome where I can just be quiet and like, why don't people hear me? <laughs> don't they know how awesome I am? Like, that's not how life works. Right? Malcolm X said, the squeaky hinge gets the grief. Right? Where, where there's noise, there's attention. So, <coughs> participating within the confines of the community, trying to find a voice that shares what you want to see happen, is extremely <coughs> I think this uh, question I just got is very similar, which uh, as a youth, I want to be involved more with the masjid to bring other youth uh, at the masjid, but I feel like elders focus on other things. How do I bring change while respecting elders? Yeah, I mean, one of the models that we're seeing now in nonprofits, especially like mosques, is the idea of like cultures within a broader culture. There's subcultures. Like for example, we have a baby boomer community. So that, that community has certain needs that need to be addressed. We have a singles community, we have a divorcee community, we have family, we have professionals. So within that, you have to be able to craft your own program. Right? So you have like a subculture of youth, it, 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 and the institution needs to understand that people need to leave you alone. Right? People, of course, for someone who's perhaps much older and, and, and culturally distant from your culture, they see you, you know, hard in the parking lot. That's like a bit out. It's like, that's like blowing their mind, right? But there has to be an understanding. That, that goes back to what I talked about, about the meaning of the institution, right? There needs to be an environment that says, listen, no one is allowed to emotionally, physically, or verbally abuse Community. No one is allowed to go and religiously reprimand them except the Imam. That's the job of the Imam. So what we do is instead of going and yelling at the youth because they're wearing, you know, Kaepernick shirts, unfortunately, I have the RG3 ones, it's like worth nothing now. Um, but Kaepernick may not come back. But we have Someone goes to the imam and say, hey, I saw this kid. He wasn't wearing the Tom Brady jersey. This is a horrible, this is an egregious violation. Please tell them to take off that Kaepernick jersey. So now the imam, that's his job. And what you do is you force the imam now to develop relationships with people in the community. And you protect the community from the police. So I would say that there has to be that subculture of young people in the community. They have to be given the freedom to kind of make mistakes and do youth things, and given that, 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 that bandwidth, if you will, right, to do their program. Great. Uh, last question. Um, a lot of uh, 10, 12, 14 year olds uh, carry their iPhones with them or cell phones, and they, they're glued to it all day and night. Would you give, what advice would you give them? Just pray a lot. <laughs> it's a tough one. <laughs> you know, uh, it's, it's difficult. Um, and I don't, I don't think that there's a simple answer for how fast this has happened socially and then how it's carried over socially. But it goes back to what meaning do they extract from having these phones? Right? A lot of them are using it for social Snapchat and Twitter and Yik Yak. And, you know, there's a million of these things now. How do they communicate with their friends? I think, again, you have to set down very clear rules about time. How much time are you going to use? Right? We have a nine to five. Like, I have a rule. So when I go home at five o'clock, I'm not your mom anymore. That's done. Unless, of course, it's the real emergency, too. Not just I have an emergency, but like a real, real emergency. Other than that, no. So I think there has to be Family time has to take place. It has to be a time. It's interesting, I was in Malaysia visiting my children, live in Malaysia with their mother, and I went there and I said, hey, let's go out today, and you guys, I made this mistake, you guys leave your phones. And she found my daughter said, what about you? You leave your phone. And I was like, back. I got that mood Angry Birds too. <laughs> Okay, I was like, but I use it for work. She's like, if you're gonna ask us to do it, you gotta do it too. I was like, but what about like a GPS shit? We'll take a cab, right? 
And then, so we spent the day together without phones. I felt like I lost an arm. Like, you really didn't feel like you lost an organ. And then afterwards, you know, my son said to me, he's like, this is like the best time we spent together in years. You know, because we're like invested in each other. It's like weird, right? So I think modeling this behavior with them is crucial as well. Like there should be times where none of us, like dinner time, we're going out for dinner, no phones, right? <coughs> Social events with each other. We need to pay attention to each other. Parents too. So that we're modeling now this, I, this best, best practices, if you will. I think that's the way to go with that one. And then at home, you gotta get on phone hours, phone on, phone off. Right? Put a block on that Wi-Fi. Cut their data on their cell phone. All right, don't get them T-Mobile. <laughs> uh, just quick, 